Hey everybody, XEI here. I'm gonna try something new on this channel, sort of like what Let's Plays are for video games. I want to try to do something uh, that has the spirit of a Let's Play, but for novels, uh, for books, for comics. I don't know how I want to do this. I don't know how to just, I don't know how to do it. So I'm just starting press, pressing record. I'm just jumping into it and uh, we'll see what happens. So the idea of this here is I'm going to start with the book called The Stolen Throne is by David Gator, the mastermind behind the Dragon Age franchise. And it is the first book of uh, the Dragon Age novels and this is actually a prequel I'll read the back just to give this uh, context this whole video context and then I'll explain how I intend to go about things but anyways this is the thrilling prequel to Dragon Age Origins the hit role-playing video game from award-winning developer Bioware when his mother the beloved rebel queen is betrayed and brutally murdered before his eyes young Merrick becomes the leader of a rebel army fighting for the freedom of his cruelly repressed nation in a land controlled by fear and struggling to command a formidable army Merrick's only allies are the outlaw Loghain and Rowan, the beautiful warrior maiden promised to him since birth. Surrounded by spies and traitors, Merrick must find a way to not only survive, but achieve Feraldin's freedom and the return of his line to the Stolen Throne. So here's how this is going to be. I'm going to start right away with a spoiler warning. Obviously, there are going to be spoilers in this video because what I intend to do is as I read the book, if I find intriguing tidbits like um, if something is written in, a, in a, an interesting way, if there's an, uh, an introduction of a new character, um, maybe I'll talk about them a little bit and how they're introduced. Um, if there's characters that are introduced that are part of the video game, I'll bring them up, I'll give them context of when they appear, how they appear, how they kind of integrate with the story. There might be summaries of the chapters I read after I read them. I want to read one chapter at a time and I want to keep these videos to one chapter at a time. So they might be small, they might be large, it depends on how much I have to say tied to the chapter. With all those seeds put out there on this video, um, I, I just want to open up the form in the comments area for there to be discussion. If you're also reading the book along with me, or if you've already read the book, maybe it was a long time ago and you just want to kind of remember the feeling of of meeting these uh, meeting these characters again for the first time or you want to be reminded of certain things that happened in the book along the way and it's sort of that feeling you have when you lend a book a friend and then you can have those discussions at the cafeteria or at work or on a drive on a road trip like I used to have these talks back in back in the day and uh, I, I enjoy that kind of uh, that back and forth thing right so that said though the vice versa here is don't spoil things for me and don't spoil things for other people in the comments. Let them kind of catch up or go along with the ride as they go so that they have a jumping off point. Um, if they feel like they're going to get spoiled before they want to get spoiled, people can leave this video series. Um, also, in terms of video games, I've only played Dragon Age Origins and Dragon Age 2. So please... Please don't spoil Dragon Age Inquisition for me. I am actually reading the three books that happened before Inquisition um, because I want that lore in my head before I play Inquisition blind. So I don't want that ruin for me. And um, just please, please be very careful in the, spo in the comments regarding spoilers. I think I've given kind of the background of what I'm going to attempt uh, because I don't really know what I'm going to do. So here we go. <laughs> I'm going to start reading, I'm going to get through the first chapter, I'm going to let this thing record so that when I have something to say I can just look up, I can talk about it real quick, and then I'll see what I do with editing and whatnot and see what happens. Cool? Alright, I'll catch you on the first piece. I will give some context, I'm, I'm actually on the, I'm not having even started reading, I'm actually on the, <laughs> I love reading just publication info. So this was published in 2009. Um, the first edition, March 2010, but the copyright is 2009. This book was actually, when they say it was a prequel to Dragon Age Origins, this book actually hit the market before the video game hit the market. I believe I'm right about that. I, re I recorded a vlog um, at the beginning of this year, I think it was January, um, just when I was doing research on the content on the publication order of these books, so when I so I could buy the ones that happened before Inquisition, and I believe what I found out is that this book came out before Dragon Age Origins, and then this book, The Calling, which features Duncan and the Deep Roads, yeah, March 2010 and copyright 2009, but this one does come first, 
This is about Merrick and Loghain and, and Rowan, I guess. This happens after the Deep Roads. This happens after, uh, yeah, things get started. So, or, I mean, things get started here, then things happen here, and then this leads to Dragon Age Origins. Okay, I'm going to go. I'm actually going to read now. Okay, I'm, I'm actually going to read now. Let's do this. I will say actually before I, I will I will say uh, I actually love reading acknowledgments too, but I will I will show this right here. So this is the map. This is the map that they're going to be um, dealing with inside this book. I love these maps that happen in fantasy in fantasy novels uh, that just kind of give you uh, a lay of the land, if you will. Uh, we're looking at Ferelden here. Uh, this pretty much looks like. We have the Carcari Wilds. I think I was saying Carcari Wilds all over. I think I like the sound of Carcari better. That's what I say in the video game. Uh, you, despite people always saying Carcari, I think there might have actually been a character who did say Carcari and another one who said Carcari. It might have been said two different ways. It doesn't matter. Okay, we have the Amaranthrine Sea. We have Denarim up in the corner, Brazilian Forest, um, which is actually on this map. The Brazilian Forest is actually coastal. And I didn't acknowledge it as coastal when I was playing Dragon Age Origins. I thought that it was Brazilian Forest and then there was like some other land underneath Denarim. But no, it's all called the Brazilian Forest. So that's interesting. Okay, we have the Kerkeri Wilds, uh, which means Ostagar somewhere around there, but it's not labeled on this map. We have Dragon's Peak, Lothering. Oh, there's Lothering, cool. Uh, the Benorn. The coastland, so, so the Benorn and the coastland, I don't think we really deal with. In no, there was a point where you do some side quests or something in the Benorn, right? And then we have, of course, the tower's got to be somewhere here. There it is, Lake Callanhad. We got Red Cliff, of course, Frostback Mountains, and so this is and oh, West Torlay. I don't know why I thought it was south. Interesting. Okay, where's the mark? So this is a map for what you essentially deal with in Dragon Age Origins. You pretty much play on this map. Now, yeah, the only thing that's not here, two things. It's Ostagar isn't marked, and um, Lake Kalanad is marked, but not the tower, not the circle tower for some reason. Anyways, now let's begin. Actually, you know what? I am going to come back before reading chapter one, <laughs> because I just read the acknowledgments, and... Um, there's always I love reading just like I, I absorb everything in a book, by the way, like you're, you're, you're also here. You have to understand I'm a completist, not just, I attempt to be completist in games and stuff like that. But when it comes to, for example, even absorbing lore, as you can see, I want to I want to read all the novels before I get into Inquisition. I absorb as much as possible when I get into something. And that includes reading forwards, afterwards, acknowledgement. I will read everything between these two covers because sometimes you you uncover little tidbits that are um they really show some depth behind what went into it from a creative perspective and the creatives involved in the game in this case david gator which was given the opportunity to to basically launch this um franchise for bioware and i do want to point out here so he thanks his parents of course because they let him play video games and uh even assuming they wouldn't lead to anything so thanks him for that because obviously it did um and then of course he acknowledges the dragon age team for uh, for bringing the world to life and and seeing this vision through but it's the last paragraph here uh, which i actually want to highlight also one last thank you to bioware for giving me such a fantastic opportunity for being the kind of game company that believes writing is something worth investing in this was in 2009 and and you can really tell that that was a huge invest like there were games before dragon age that had good writing you know i hear but you know what I, I said that out loud and i'm i'm actually having trouble i'm sure there are but i'm saying that when you play dragon age origins you can tell there's a significant advancement in terms of the writing in the game because it's faceted there's so many different things that can happen there's so many different um um directions that the narrative can go in and having mapped that out and it all being very rich despite having all these different facets uh it, like obviously like they bioware invested in the writing and it shows and uh good for them so i just want to i just want to also start off before reading the book i will i, I will also say I thank Bioware for investing in, in writing. So, okay, now let's go. Okay, I'm back. So two pages in, <laughs> and I will say, 
Good thing that so in the back here where it says where it says the whole the first sentence here when his mother the beloved rebel queen is betrayed and brutally murdered before his eyes young Merrick becomes leader of a rebel army fighting for the freedom of his cruelly repressed nation and I was like wow that that sounds like it completely spoiled an entire chunk of the book no it's literally the first paragraph two paragraphs of the story is is that so there's no spoilers they they give you it up front <laughs> okay let's, let's keep reading okay we got the first age drop so merrick in this story is 18 years old when it starts he's basically been moved from uh, rebel camp to rebel camp and raised in that environment as his mother the rebel queen um, is basically leading a rebellion against orlesian invaders um, so he's basically his whole life has been this is all he knows is is Orlesian invasion and how to and how to take them out of the Ferelden. So it's already it's immediately evident that David Gator was already setting up, um, which is intriguing because Logan hasn't been mentioned yet. But setting up what goes down with why Logan is so against um, getting Orlesian help with the, the the fifth blight, you know. So, very cool, very cool. And what went down seems to be that some Orlesians have actually paid off some of her men, some of the rebel, some of the rebels to turn and and murder the mother. And it's left this 18-year-old Merrick as king. So he's this 18-year-old king who's never given a damn. And so, you know, it's that whole it's that whole like start of the hero journey story where you have to que you question your value and why like the why me how am i going to do this it's that self doubt self denial that sets up the 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 hero character in that journey where the hero discovers themselves later on and has to go through all these like trials all these trials throughout all of this that eventually lead to him becoming um owning that hero title and um it's true to form true to form that's all i'm saying and to back up what I just said, here's the sentence that actually summarizes it very nicely. So it, it goes on like this. Maybe they would find some distant relative to take up the banner of rebellion. And if not, then it was best to let the bloodline of King Kalanhai the Great die here. Let it end with the rebel queen failing just short of her goal, rather than petering out under the leadership of her inept son. So there it is. That's the whole full self-denial there and, and just figuring it'd be best for him to just die and and let the name die with honor you know but i'm sure he'll pick it up and they're and he's going to make a name for himself and and know, logan's going to get involved and there it is the men who led her into this led the mother into this trap of people who turned on her after were nobles of ferelden that goddamn nobles of ferelden the sort who had bent knee to the orlesians so they could keep their lands. And you see that sort of come up in the lands meet sort of thing, right? Where you got it, you, you discover that all these internal politics that go on with the nobles of Fralden, and it's all a big game, you know. I mean, Orlesians got the game, game, but all nobles are jackasses from the looks of it. <laughs> They're all just jackasses. Don't trust any noble. Okay. So Merrick almost gets caught and uh, pulverizes this dude's head against uh, the root of a tree in a very Games of Thronian style. Very good, Merrick. Very good. <laughs> Lord. And we finally have the introduction of Logan on the first break after Merrick uh, finally picks his ass up and vows that if he has, if he can only do one thing as king, it's to deliver vengeance or revenge or whatever make them pay for uh, killing the mother and then the first break and we have something's happened Logan muttered frowning he stood at the edge of the forest absolutely wiping mud off his leathers the effort was pointless as his clothing was as worn and as filthy as one might expect from a poacher the Orlesians of course had less kind names for him and the others like him criminals thieves and bandits too the only one desperation forced their hand and, and immediately second paragraph, not that Logan much cared what the Orlesians called him, since it was their fault his family had been forced off the farm. So he's a farm boy. Oh, I think I remember the lore from the Codex. Wasn't it that he he get he becomes a Night Squire and then raises, he, he climbs through the ranks. That's right. 
silly me. That's like literally the <laughs> one of the first things you learn in Dragon Age Origins. Okay, let's go. I see. So because the Orlesians basically take over and then own the land, uh, the Orlesians don't believe in free men have, owning a farm, like having a farm to their name. It's basically owned to Orle. You have to pay taxes. And so Logan's father, essentially, he, he saves and he pays the taxes the first year, but then the second year, he, he doesn't pay the taxes. So the Elysian soldiers come around and they basically say, you know, now that you don't pay the taxes, you're now going to be under arrest because of tax evasion. And, and they basically took off into the wilds, banding together with other desperate souls to echo out a living however they could. Interesting. So he's a survivor, straight up. I mean, he was probably... I don't have an age yet for Loghain, but it sounds like he's pretty much... Uh, I mean, he grew up hating that, or the, he's probably... It's all he's ever known. L Loghain is out with a dude called Dan and hunting on lands that are, I guess, presumably watched over by Orlesians, or they're trying to screw over some Orlesian. Or, sorry, they're trying to screw over a noble that has Orlesian sympathies. They're trying to pick up good name with Orlesians. But anyways, um, and so they're trying not to get caught, and then they overhear the this commotion and of course we know where this is going to lead it's going to lead to they overhear these these betray these traitors the ones that killed the queen uh chasing merrick through the forest and i'm about to get to that part i'm sure of it and of course when they hear this commotion they think that it's actually they're screwed like they've been caught and wh whoever's coming through the woods is actually after them because they they uh, yeah because they were hunting illegally i guess they're not really brigands they're not really cutthroats so basically there's this, this constable in Fralden lets this group of people do whatever they want they just have to agree that they can't steal from travelers they like, they can't cause trouble from people coming and going this entire group of uh people who are together which include logan and this danon fellow um they know that one day that constable is going to get forced by the Orlesians to go out and hunt all of these people down and just, you know, arrest them or whatever the case might be. So they think that that's what's going down and they're getting screwed. But of course, we know where this is going to lead. Oh, so there you go. So now they're bringing up Bans Yorick. I thought that was just kind of like this name that was dropped in passing. It's like this band that is trying to get... Um, trying to get favor with the Orlesian usurpers and and that's kind of like that kind of, that's kind of like the land they're on or near or something anyways um but it turns out so it's so i'm thinking this is going to lead into bans york was one of the nobles that ended up betraying the queen like getting a bunch he's probably the guy who like caused all this so it's all going to line up so interesting setup here. So the idea here is Logan figures out that there's at least 20 men tied to this band Siorik that are in the woods. So he's like, well, whatever they're doing in here, it's bad for the band. It's bad for his like group of, of people, right? Free guys. Um, and and so he sticks around and he because his concern is whatever they're out here doing like this Suark fellow has this open allegiance with the Orlesians and it can't be good for the group. But interesting detail in this paragraph here because it sort of foreshadows uh, things that happen in, in Origins is the political goings on of Ferelden were none of his concern, his being Loghain. Survival was his concern and anything political was important only when it affected that survival directly. Interesting, right? Interesting phrase there. Because think about it. When you're playing Dragon Age Origins and you get to the lands meet. And it's all about playing the nobles. Getting the nobles on your side. Um, even just how he sort of stumbles about. He, he doesn't do it well. And that he gets his daughter involved. Because he needs sort of a face and a voice that can can lead. Whereas he's, he's sort of just temporarily taken the spot. Because the king is dead. But the lands meet is... If you think about that line, right? You're survival was his concern and anything political was important only when it affected his survival directly i mean what happens at the lands meet when it comes down to it he accepts that he's lost to the warden commander to the warden at the time and he accepts that the nobles have made the decision and so there's that turning point right where at least in the xander playthrough the like my playthrough um there's that turning point where he gives up and for the first time he he, uh, he comes off as a completely different character like maybe the character that's actually going to be presented here someone who accepts his fate uh, 
the fate his fate is literally put into the warden's hands and then that's one of those facets of the game where you can make a decision do you kill do you keep does he become a great warden do you right and so um because his survival is affected so he was willing to he's willing to compromise whatever his goals are and survive and it's right there in like the first that couple dozen pages like two dozen pages right like it sets him up cool and so there it is Merrick bursting through the bushes he's being the, with the chasing sounds behind him and then you know Dan and like this bigger dude he's a little bit like sketch I, I, there's like a pair like a couple pages prior it, it's it's like Logan doesn't really know who this guy is like he thinks like maybe this guy's a murderer and he likes to hear it like he likes to cut people and hear him hear him scream and stuff like that <laughs> but um, they just I guess they don't want to ask questions they're just like people who are free folk they got to survive out there and whatever and, and as long as you don't cause crap uh, you're banded together and so like Merrick bursts through these bushes and Dana's like we gotta peace out because this guy's being chased and if this guy's being chased we're gonna get screwed because we're not we shouldn't be like we're not legal you know like we can get we can get screwed anytime and so uh Logan sort of calms diffuses the situation puts this guy's hand down like it's already on the dagger ready to go and then Logan's just looking at Merrick and he just asks who's chasing you and Merrick responds Orlesian dogs Right. And, and it does mention that they're about the same age. So uh, good um, uh, detail to keep in mind. And then uh, Logan looks back at him and says, good answer. Come with me. Right. And so they run off because, of course, that's the one thing that unites them immediately. Like nothing else needs to be said. There's a dude running away from Orlesian dogs. And that's the enemy. And boom, now we're bonded. We're bonded by uh, that similar, uh, similar detail. So, yeah, cool. Logan is now noticing that despite like the clothing, Merrick's clothing is all messed up, torn and bloodied and stuff like that. But it does it doesn't look like just like some poppers wear. It, this is probably noble. Um, so he's starting to kind of question like who the hell is this guy, right? I mean, let, little does he know he's got the king. You saved the king. So here's the confirmation. These were Ban Siorlik's men, I take it. Logan asks Merrick and uh, some of them he says they killed a friend of mine Merrick responds hmm not being uh, very open all right so so Dannon and Logan basically agree to just bring Merrick to camp because he's shivering he's cold he's all busted up maybe he just gets himself warmer and then gets a cloak to look less conspicuous then he can make up his mind or whatever but then it ends like uh it, it, there's a cool line here where it's basically the young man stared at the ground uncomfortable and shamefaced. I don't have anything valuable. And then he added, to repay you, I mean. And in quotes, like in thoughts, right? Uh, Low grain thinks to steal was what he uh, really meant. But it was hard to be offended when he and Dan and uh, were, were indeed thieves. So so there we go. Now we know that, okay, they they do classify themselves as thieves uh, out in the woods like that. And Lowgrain steps forward and extends his hand and says, you can call me Lowgrain. And the blonde man hesitates and then takes Lowgrain's hand, shaking it, and says, Haram. So he, he takes a different name. He lies. And then the last page of this paragraph, the last paragraph, first, as I turn, as I say that, I turn the page, first sentence, it was a lie, of course. Locrine wondered for a moment if he would regret doing this. His gut had never been wrong before. But there was always a first time. Yes, indeed, there will be a first time, Locrine. Let's see if it happens in this book or the game, huh? And then, still, the die had been cast, nodding to Hiram. He turned, and the two left the forest together. Now, it's funny, because I read the name Haran, 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 Haram, really early on, and um, because it's a, it's a kind of a unique name, and so it stood out to me, but now that I, I'm looking back, I'm like, I don't know why I read the name Haram. I have no idea who it was in reference to, what it was. Was it the name of his father? Like, I wish I could just do a control F on these pages, but I can't, so... Let me find this and it come back. Now I need to know. I can't find it, but I'm having a trigger moment now as I'm scanning some of these pages where I think Haram gets mentioned very in passing as being this guy who's who's always at his mother's side and likely died during the assault uh, that took down of the traitors. 
me just validate that. God damn it, where are you, Haram? I know I read your name. Oh, Haram. Where are you, Haram? Was it mentioned that in passing that it's that hard to find, man? Haram, I know you're in here. Finally found Haram, and it is so subtle, like the, the, the name drop here and its context, and it's sort of ends up being sort of important but anyway so it's it's right here it's like basically when Merrick is is running away and it's very early on where he just he witnesses the murder of his mother and he's running through these woods and he's sort of like trying to catch his breath and he has no weapon because he looks down at his empty sheath and that's where it's it, he's like he wasn't armed an empty sheath dangled at his waist his belt knife lent to Haram not two hours earlier to cut some rope Haram, one of his mother's most trusted generals and a fine man he had known since childhood, most likely lying dead at his queen's side, their blood cooling in the midnight air. Merrick cursed himself for a fool and tried to put the image out of his mind. That's literally the only time the name Haram is dropped. But it seems to be aligned with a very important fellow who he associates with prote the protection of his mother. I like the idea of symbolism and stuff in stories. And there's this other kind of notion in fantasy where the power of names, you know, and uh, the moment where you you give yourself a name or someone gives you a name or you use a name to uh, to take to get power over uh, when summoning demons or I mean this it's a trope in fantasy that's used a lot and so I love the idea that the very first chapter ends with that trope where it's um, you know low grade saying it's a lie I get it's a lie I wonder if this is going to screw me over later but it's the idea that Merrick chooses his name. He ch he he gives himself a name, an identity. Who he's gonna and in it's in that identity because it's almost like he doesn't trust himself. He because it's the whole like I'm king now, but I'm not good enough, you know. And um, like I have I have this uh, I have all this pressure on me now that I've sort of thrown away and. Because my mom was like perfect and she was never going to, you know, be taken down. So why do I have to care about all this noble or rebel, rebel prince nonsense, right? But, and so because he couldn't trust himself, because he, it's almost like he can't accept the fact that he is king now and he's got this like weight to bear, even if it's like to lead a rebel army, wherever this army might be. Um, but he has to give himself a different identity so that he can almost embrace the idea of the general, right? Like he's not, he can't even envision himself being king, but he's, it's enough for him to take the name of a general in order. It's kind of the stepping stone of like, maybe, you know, he, he can be, he can enter the psychology or the spirit of this man that was, that would always stay by his, by his mother's side. And, and in memory of his mother, he needs to do the same, but to protect himself, he needs to conceal the fact that he's King, but at the same time, show respect to the mother. So that was my reading of that. I am a big, I, like I said, I'm a big fan of symbolism. Um, I used to, um, analyze, uh, fantasy in particular in school, uh, I just I love I love all the things so maybe I'll talk about that as I go too. maybe that'll interest you it'll give some dynamics to this uh, there's also something I love to do with uh, movies in particular but I've done this kind of exercise with short stories with comics with graphic novels with novels um, maybe I'll bring that to this series too um, it, it sort of mashes together sounds oh it's it's a weird way of saying it but a sort of formula that's a very logical formula that's based on ratios of storytelling i love the idea of oral tradition and why there's certain beats in oral tradition and how you have to get certain ideas out the rules of threes the importance of circles the power of names there's all these notions in story um that that originate in oral tradition but in particular the the kind of formula i'm talking about it's more of a thing in hollywood script writing but I've expanded on that by analyzing things like the hero's journey, the 10 years of basically notes in the spreadsheet that kind of aligns different theories together and maps them out in the, into this matrix that uh, what, I'm, what I was trying to sort of analyze is story construction and how beats work and the timing and the ratio between what makes a good memorable story. So even though this is a formula and it has panned out in a comic, uh, like I've tested a comic against this short story against this, a trade against this, a novel against this, movies against this, TV shows against this. Um, what I've learned is for the majority of, of 
um, good results, they do follow this formula. So despite it being a formula, it can be broken and good things can be created by breaking the formula, but you sort of have to be really good in, in how you do it. But if you, but almost on a subconscious level was actually what I was investigating is on a subconscious level, are we as consumers of creativity, consumers of fiction, whether that's TV or movies or comics or whatever, do we subconsciously wait for certain triggers and beats and storytelling? Um, and so, so, so that our subconscious puts together the, the, these patterns that make good stories memorable. So I'm going to try to do that for this. I don't know how well it's going to pan out, but I'll tell you right now, this first paragraph, uh, maybe I'll come back in the next episode, I'll sort of tell you what my findings are, and I'll explain a little bit about what I mean by the formula, if you're all interested. Um, but it, but a, to summarize what that will mean for, for when I'm analyzing novels, is is I get the last page of the novel, right, which is 400, and so the formula is literally an algorithm. <laughs> this sounds so weird to say when talking about creative works, and people always... They, they always like they, they don't understand what I'm, what I'm getting into it's just this exercise I like to do because I think it's it's fun and when it works out it just revalidates the fact that there is this subconscious formula that sort of encompasses this what I believe is like this uh, universal consciousness that starts with oral tradition and, uh, and it's all these inputs we get from our s social like all these social inputs that we get from creative works that use this subconsciously that then inform our subconscious to give back to this universal consciousness this none of that's going to make sense in it. anyways that's all getting all really weird and stuff so if that sounds like something that's going to be an interesting uh, element to bring to this series. I'm willing to do it because like I said, I don't know what the hell I'm trying to do, but I want to do something. I think it's fun to talk about books in a different way. I don't want this to just be a review. I want this to be more. Um, so there it is. That's the first episode. I'm just going to end this here because this is going to evolve as we go. Um, I'm just exploring ideas about all of this and I just want to engage with all y'all. So don't forget to explore, engage, and inspire. Catch you on next time. Peace, everybody.